Amen. You know, um, you know, sometimes when, you know, uh, when you stand up and hear, you know, I have a message that's prepared and I want to, you know, of course I pray through, I spend time of it, on it and kind of know where God wants to go and what he wants to speak. But at the same time, you know, when you're in a service and you're in a time of worship, you feel this sense of bubbling, you know, of what God wants to do in a moment. And I think that that's what we always want to do. We always want to be very, very sensitive to what the Holy Spirit uh, is doing in our midst. Amen. And I just feel as during the time of worship, you know, and of course in the pre-service prayer, and I feel like God really wants to meet with people uh, this evening. You know, uh, last week, you know, if you were here um, at the end of the worship, uh, Pastor Elijah came up and he gave a word of knowledge. You know, and he said that there's somebody, and, and last week, of course, the songs were just singing about the goodness of God, you know. And, and he said that there's somebody here, maybe you're thinking in your heart, what's so good about God, you know. And, uh, and he just gave that word, and then he went on and uh, made, uh, welcomed everybody. And then on Monday, if y'all didn't know this, Pastor Elijah has made a toast box at, um, at uh, East Point at CME, his office, okay? So he's always there working. And then on Monday, somebody, this lady he doesn't know, just walked up to him. And he said, hey, Pastor Elijah, you're here. He said, yeah, 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 I'm here. He says, by the way, you gave that word of knowledge on Saturday about somebody saying that. And that lady said to Pastor Elijah, said, you know, I'm that lady. You know, we were singing all those songs. And I was thinking in my mind, what's so good about God, you know? And then the Lord just spoke to her. And when that word of, was, was given, she just felt like the Lord saw her, the Lord knew her, and she was so ministered to. But you know, this evening, as we are, we are in this place, I just feel like God really wants to meet with us. And you know, we come and there's really a spectrum of things that we're going through. Some of us, maybe we had a really great week. You know, we closed a deal, we had great announcement, you know, big commission coming or something. But others of us, we maybe had a bit of a tougher week. Maybe there are some struggles in our hearts. Maybe there are things that we're going through in our lives, you know. But wherever you are, I just feel like God wants to meet with us today. Amen? And some of us, you know, maybe we're in a season where we're saying, Lord, you know, speak to me. I want to hear your voice. Lord, I want to move in some, you know, I want to grow in my walk with you. I want to do things with you that I've never done before. And I just feel like God wants to answer every person that is in this place. Amen. And I want to just, I want to just encourage you to come with a heart of expectation. And I think what is really important is that the Bible tells us this, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema word of God. That when, when God speaks, when the Holy Spirit says something to us and we grab onto it and we say, Lord, I believe. I believe. And we might not feel anything inside of us, but we respond to the word of God and we say, hey, I believe. Amen? You know, and, and maybe, you, you know, today you listen to the message and you walk away and you might not hear anything. You might not register. It might not be a, you know, a deep impression in, with you. But I want to encourage you that in this place, in this moment, God wants to touch people. Amen? And God wants to meet us where we are at. God wants to encounter us. Amen? And if you just you know, express that heart to the Lord. And, you know, and this week I believe God will do something fresh. God will, you know, God will visit us afresh. God will speak something afresh to us. Amen? Uh, myself on Monday, I, did, I had this real tremendous encounter with God. Uh, I met, you know, uh, a brother uh, for breakfast, you know, and then as I finished a meeting with the brother, I went into my car in the car park and I was trying to reply to some text. And while I'm, I, I, while, while I'm sitting in my car in the car park, I just met the Lord. And the Lord just spoke to me something really powerful and it just changed the way I think about something, you know. And that's how God does something. That's how God works. God invades our space and He literally changes our situation for us. Amen? Um, well, today, this evening, actually, I want to talk about... Um, Digging wells instead of building fences. Amen. And this is, of course, one of our core convictions. And you can go onto the website. You can take a look at it. But essentially, in May of last year, uh, as many of you know, I have a very, very dear friend called Pastor Nikki. And some of you might be familiar with Pastor Nikki Raibodi. And he is uh, an Indian um, at birth. And at the age of nine, he moved to America. And uh, he's been pastoring in America uh, for many years now in Columbia, South Carolina. But in May, he spoke to me and he said, Lip, I have a prophetic word for you. And I said to him, I said, share with me, please. And he shared with me a word and he started by telling me about a story and about cattle raising 
in that part of America, in South Carolina. And he says the interesting about, thing about cattle raising in South Carolina is that generally the farmers there do not erect fences around their farms. They leave the cattle to roam and to go wherever they want to. But the main thing they did was that they'll put these watering holes around. They'll dig, um, they wouldn't dig wells, but these watering holes that are there, okay? And what happens is because these cattle, they drink a lot of water, okay? And they, they you know, and they have to constantly drink. They're not like camels where they so store the water inside of them. And so because of their need for water, they always don't depart very far away from the watering holes. But when they give birth to little calves, okay, the calves, they don't know it. They don't realize how dependent they are upon those watering holes. And so those calves will wander off and they'll go. And then when thirst strikes, they will be uh, hit by it. You know, and they'll be like, oh no, where's the watering hole? And they have to rush back. And many, many times they will suffer because of that. But all it takes the calf is to suffer once. And then they learn to never depart far away from the watering holes. And so this is how they would do farming there. And, and it was at this point that Pastor Nicky said this to me. He said, Lip, God has called you to be a well digger and not a fence builder. Because in some situations, we build fences around our farm animals so that they don't wander off, right? But in this case, they just dug wells. And because of the need for water, people will gather or the cattle will gather around the wells. And he said to me that, you know, well diggers are very different from fence builders. And you know, this really, really resonated with me. I knew that God was speaking to me through Pastor Nikki. You know, and when we began to conceive Life Church, I felt that uh, this is one of the core convictions that God wants us to have here in Life Church, that in Life Church, we will really focus on digging wells instead of erecting fences. Now, you might, ask, you might ask me, what does that mean? What does all this mean? Okay, and that's, um, you know, I, I'm glad that you asked that because that's what I'm going to share about this evening. And I want to give us three very simple things to demonstrate and to show us what is the nature of a well digger vis-a-vis -vis someone that builds a fence. And in that sense, it also, I believe, gives us a sense of how we should build our lives. You know, and if God has given and entrusted us with uh, responsibilities, whether we are leading a team or whether we are in our careers and we are in some form of a leadership, I want to encourage you to listen to this because this applies not just in the realms of the Spirit, amen, but it will apply to the work and to your friendship and to your social circles as well and the influence that God will give to you. Now, the first thing I want to bring across to us is that Jesus demonstrates this. Jesus is a well digger. Jesus was not as much a fence builder as he was a well digger. And I think Jesus particularly illustrates this because he was never ever concerned about the numerical size of his followers. Never once did Jesus said to the 5,000 after he fed them, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, fish and with bread. Never once did he say, okay, now you all have eaten from me, you all must stay with me all the time. In fact, there was a time where there was a contention and they were comparing Jesus to John the Baptist and people were saying, hey, John the Baptist, take note, notice this. Jesus is now baptizing more people than you. The ministry of Jesus is now exceeding your ministry. And people were beginning to compare the Lord's ministry to John the Baptist's ministry. And you know what Jesus did? Jesus uprooted his ministry and he went off somewhere else to do ministry because he didn't want to be in competition. I mean, Jesus was never driven by numbers. He was never about keeping people around with him all the time. I think this is driven home, especially in John chapter 6. And this is a famous chapter in the Gospel of John. And it is at this chapter that many of the disciples that followed Jesus began to turn back and stop following him. And the reason was because Jesus at this point was talking about drinking his blood and eating his flesh. Now, that's a hard thing, but of course, on hindsight today, we understand that the Lord is talking about, you know, his body that will be broken for us, his blood that will be shed for us. He's not talking about literally, uh, he's not talking about cannibalism, okay? He's not talking about blood drinking, okay? But he's talking about the work that will be done through his sacrifice on the cross. Now, so all this, at this point, the vast majority of his disciples have turned away. And guess what Jesus does? There's, there's 12 disciples left, and this is the final 12. And instead of saying to them, you know what, don't leave. I explained to you what I'm trying to say, okay? So, you know, they've all misunderstood me, but let me explain to you what I'm saying. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus goes on and says to his 12, and he says, hey guys, do you all want to go also? 
Bye bye. <laughs> and the thing is this: the disciples said to the Lord. Peter said this, of course. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Isn't that interesting? The vast majority of his followers have left him. The reason Jesus is talking about something that's difficult to understand. And yet the Lord, the Peter uh, and, the, and the other 11 said to the Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Who shall we go to? You are the well. We have drank of this well in you. We have tasted the springs of water that has come forth from you. And we know that it brings true life. It is, it is a well of eternal life and we are not leaving because we know that you have done a well. Amen. Now, this is so interesting because the question for us to ask out of this is simply this. Are we a well or are we a fence? Is there a well bubbling up out of us? Because Jesus also said this. He says, if, you, if we believe in him, then out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that all of us have experienced this before. Have you met people and after a conversation with them, you know, you feel drained. You feel empty. You feel despondent and generally negative. Have you ever met people like that? That when you meet them and talk to them, wow, it's so draining. And then when they text you and say, hey, want to meet up again? You are all, you straight away think, let me come up with some excuse, okay? Because I need to build up my energy level to go and meet these people. And then there are other people that are so different that all you need to do is spend a few minutes with them and immediately you will feel this sense of refreshment in you. Conversations with these people bring about a fresh longing for the Lord. Conversations with these people lift your vision higher and you begin to see beyond and something up, uplifting happens to you and you walk away energized thinking, hey, I can take on the world, amen. You see, the difference between that is that one is a well flowing with living water and the other is dryness. It's a fence, amen. And this is something that we can become here in Life Church, one of the things that we've, uh, we've, we, we've you know, we, we want to do is this, that whatever we do here in Life Church, whatever things we put into place, our, the question we want to ask ourselves is, is not what will this, what is the result of this? If we do this, we do that, uh, will, it, will income increase? When we do this, when we do it, will numbers increase? We don't want to be result driven. The thing that we want to ask whenever we do something is simply this, is this life giving? Does this give life to people? You know, and if it gives life, it, it, if it releases the life of God to people, then we want to do it. Amen? Right? One souls, another waters, God gives the increase. That's up to God. God is the one who blesses. And you know what? When God gives increase, He adds no sorrow to it. And we, all we want to do is just focus on giving life. Now, the second thing I want to mention is this. Truth versus true. Now, I want to draw a distinction for us between what is truth and what is true. Now, listen carefully to this part because I feel like this portion can be easily taken out of context. And I want to define for you what I mean when I say truth versus true. Okay? Now, this is what I believe. Okay? That the whole Bible is true, but not the whole Bible is truth. Right? And it, it, it comes to the definition that I want to give to you. Right? Truth is something in the Bible that is unchanging forever. Doesn't matter the context, doesn't matter the time, doesn't matter the cultural you know, instance ever. In It is always true. For example, that Jesus died on the cross for all of us. He was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father and there's no other way to the Father except through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And that is truth. Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary, supernaturally conceived by the Holy Spirit. He's part of the divine Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He was at the very beginning. That's all these things are truth. Nothing ever changes the status of what truth is. Amen? Culture, times, doesn't change that. But you see, there are many things in the Bible that doesn't fall into the category of what I call truth, but I call them true. Because they are true within a certain setting and timing. Now, I'll give you an example. 
The Lord said this, and you'll recall this very well. The Lord says, when you give, do not let your right hand know what your left hand is giving. Right? And the Lord does that because He doesn't want hypocrisy. But shortly after the Lord said that, guess what Jesus said? God, Jesus said, um, let your good works so shine before men that they may see it and give glory to God. Right? Now, if you want your good works to shine before men, guess what? You've got to know. You've got to tell what you're doing. Right? So on the one hand, the Lord says, don't let people know. Shh. On the next hand, He says, shout at the, to- at the rooftop. Let them know. Amen. So which is which? What are you supposed to do? Give me another example. The Lord said this. When someone slaps you on one cheek, what do you do? You turn the other cheek. You know what? Jesus didn't do that. When he was arrested, when he was questioned by the high priest, you know, and he answered the high priest what was right, the servant of the high priest slapped the Lord. Guess what? Jesus never turned his other cheek. But he said to the servant, if I speak what is right, why do you slap me? Either Jesus is not following what he's saying, or there is a sense of an understanding that the, the, what the Lord says, there are instances, there's a context to which what, it makes something right. Amen? You see, the same action in one situation is a correct response, but in another situation, a different action is actually required. And, really, and this really depends on the situation, the times, the culture, and the direction that God has given to us, right? Now, the thing is this, most things in life doesn't fall nicely into a formula, right? But as human beings, we love a formula, right? As a pastor, many times people have asked me this, Pastor, if this situation is this, 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 what should I do, right? And I often tell people, hey, it's very hard to tell you exactly what to do, right? And the important thing for us is to always pray and to ask the Lord and say, Lord, what am I supposed to do in this situation? You see, when Adam and Eve were in, in the Garden of Eden, they had the presence of God. They had the voice of God. But guess what? They chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is a formula. I just want to know what's right, what's wrong. But God didn't give us the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He gave us Himself so that we can walk with Him and be in relationship with Him. You understand? Right? You see, we very much here prefer not to build fences around something that is true. But instead, we want to build fences around something that is truth. If we build something around what is truth, what is forever eternally true, it is okay, it's safe. Right? Can I say that here in live church, um, we empathize with those who struggle with same-sex attraction, but we will not do a same-sex marriage because God created marriage to be between a man and a woman. And that's truth. And that's okay for us to set a rule over that. But can I say this, that most things that we set a rule over isn't truth, but it is about something that is true. If we build a fence around something that is true instead of truth, What is a blessing in one season will easily become a stumbling in a different season. In Judges chapter 8, there is an example of this given to us, and that's where Gideon, after the great victory, you know, um, uh, know, over the enemies of God, they took the spoils, and then out of the spoils, he made an ephod. In Judges chapter 8, verse 29, it says, Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in a city, Ophrah, And all Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Now, there are actually several interpretations as to why Gideon made this ephod. Some of it is absolutely fascinating. But we don't have time to deep dive into why this is so. But suffice to say is this. I think it's very clear that Gideon's intentions were good. He didn't want, his intention was not to create an idol so that Israel would play the harlot and will fall into sin and to be snapped by it. That was not his intention. Gideon's intention was good. He really wanted perhaps to, you know, this ephod to represent a means to hear the voice of God. Maybe he wanted it to be something that would draw the people towards worshipping God. Maybe it was something in which it would remind the people of the victories that God has given to them so that in the monument of what is being done, they will propel them to greater exploits in the Lord. But unfortunately, this very effort that was meant to be a blessing in one season became a snare for Israel, leading to idolatry in later seasons. Right? 
Because it's human nature for us to want to make a monument out of what God has done in one season. So I want to encourage us here, the vision of the church is that we want you to encounter God, to discover truth and to find purpose. But we sure don't want you to build a monument around your encounter. Amen? We sure don't want you to say, hey, 20 years ago, I had this great encounter with God. No, no, we want you to have an encounter with God today and to continue to have an encounter with God day to day. So we want to be careful that even with our encounters and our desire to honour God, that we do not accidentally create a snare for the future generation. Now in the days of Jesus, the Sabbath was again a major point of contention between the Lord and the religious establishment. And because by the time that Jesus came, there were so many rules attached to the Sabbath. What you could do, what you cannot do. I mentioned this some services ago that, you know, that even you couldn't, like if you accidentally wet your clothes, you couldn't put it out and hang it for dry. You know, and there were all these additional rules built around the Sabbath, so much so that by the time of Jesus, your original intention and purpose of the Sabbath was completely lost. Jesus had to reestablish to the people that He is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus had to remind the people that the Sabbath was created for us and not for it to rule over us. Amen? God created the Sabbath to bless us, not to, buy, not to bind us. And the Sabbath was created, you know, such that good should be done on the Sabbath day, right? And what was from God, you know, what was meant to bless us by their rules that they erected, by the fences that they built, eventually became a burden and a shackle for the people. You see, I believe this. I believe that if there are fences already that's been built, you shouldn't go and tear the fences down. You should first go find out why was the fence there in the first place. Right? Go find out why is the fence there in the first place. Don't go tearing it down. Right? But then I also believe that oftentimes we erect fences to prevent something that has gone wrong from going wrong again. Many times fences are there because we are reacting to something that happened. Okay, uh, all, most of us here are Singaporeans, live in Singapore for many, many years, and we're very familiar, right? All you need is one thing to go wrong, and then there'll be a lot of fences erected. Cannot do this, cannot do that. Okay? I'm not talking about any uh, political party whatsoever, but I think it's a general uh, Singaporean thing that we like to do, right? But the thing is this, rules are often blind, rules makes us lazy in exercising judgment, Rules are a lot easier to follow than a relationship walk with God. Amen? Because you just need to check the rules. What should I do? But you know, if you want to walk with the Lord, then you have to wait for Him. You have to incline your ears. And you have to take time to hear what the Lord will say to you in every situation. Amen? The next thing I want to mention is about understanding wells. Okay? And I want to mention uh, very briefly a few things. The first is uh, Rehoboth. Now, this is my favorite well in the Bible, Rehoboth. It is found in Genesis chapter 26, verse 22. And it says that, And he moved from there and dug another well, this is Isaac, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called the name Rehoboth, because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Isaac is the well digger. And they have livestock, they need wells they do, uh, to water the livestock. Now the first two wells they dug became, uh, was fought over. There was contention, there was strife, there was quarreling. And then finally they dug a third well and when they dug this third well, all the quarreling over it stopped and so he named it Rehoboth, which means spaciousness. Okay? And, so, and it's named so because God has made space for them and now they will be fruitful. Now the common thread in all these names, okay, is that they all relate to people. Strive, contention, quarrel. You never quarrel with an object, right? You quarrel with a person. You never have strife, you know, with something that is there, just dead, you know? But you quarrel and you have strife with a person, right? And, and at the same time, you know, what we need to realize about wells is that wells are really focused on people, right? This is opposed to making processes and efficiency our focus, Instead, when we talk about wells, when we talk about Rehoboth, it's really about making room for people. Making room for people. And as we talk about wells here in Life Church, one of the things that we really want to do is we want to know people, 
We want to understand what God is calling people to do. And we want to make room for people. Now, all of us work in organizations. The bigger the organization it is, the more efficiency is important. And when you want efficiency, guess what? You need to ignore the individualism of people. Because for efficiency to work well, everybody needs to be uniform. But not so in the church. In the church, we don't want everybody to be uniform. We don't want all of you to be alike. We want you all to be different, to be whom God has made you to be and to remain and to retain that uniqueness. Now, and this is what Rehoboth is. Rehoboth is really about taking the time and making room for people. And I want to suggest this to us that if you are a leader in whatever field that you are at, if you are a, you know, a parent in your home with children, right, this applies. What you lead, what you create, may it be Rehoboth, may it be a place of spaciousness. May it not be a place where you demand everybody to fit in. You see, for too long, the church is a place where we can't tell people, hey, come and fit in to what we need you to be. Right? And we have not understood that God wants the diversity in the people that are there. God never called us to be bricks. He never called us bricks being built into a house for God. He calls us living stones. And stone buildings are very different from brick buildings. Brick buildings are easy to erect, fast to put up because all the bricks are exactly the same. But living stones are hard. you got to find where each stone fit in because there are some big, some small, some jagged in some way, shapes of all kinds and sizes. Now look around you. We have people of all shapes and sizes here. Amen. Amen. I want to quickly mention about Rebecca the well. And this is another account found in Genesis 24. And um, Eliezer is looking for a spouse for Isaac. He comes, he prays a simple prayer uh, that the one that God has chosen would water all his camels. Now, he had 10 camels and other animals, okay? And Rebecca comes and Rebecca says, let me water all your animals and let me refresh them. I don't know how much a uh, camel drinks. I made a quick Google search on it. Somewhere between 30 to 50 gallons of water. Quick calculation I made. It took uh, Rebecca about 60 times back and forth, 60 buckets of water to water 10 camels. 60 buckets, okay? Um, try, it at, try it out at home and uh, uh, see how much effort that is required. And yet the thing about Rebecca is that she's so generous in what she did that she didn't calculate based on conventional return on investment. She didn't know who Eliezer was. He didn't know this moment of generosity would be the stepping stone to the future that God has for her. All she was was just generous and kind to a stranger that she doesn't know. She wasn't expecting anything in return. You see, when we are guided by our values of desiring to be life-giving, of being generous, of being kingdom-minded, of learning to see things from heaven's perspective, then we move away from a conventional calculation of what is worth it. What is worthwhile, right? And we begin to measure things in the, in the way that God wants us to measure things. Now, I don't know how we're going to do this, but here we're going to try to measure things the way God wants to measure things. Amen? Right? I, I think to myself, you know, if God blesses us here in Life Church, you know, some, many times we think a huge surplus in church at the end of the year, financial surplus, means that, hey, we're doing well. Okay, I don't know if that, of course, a, neg a deficit is not a good reason, okay? It's not a good thing either. But I don't know if having a huge surplus is a good thing. Because if it doesn't line up with what God wants us to do, if we're not measuring, if we're just measuring numbers the way the world measures it, then I think we really missed it. Because there's a generosity required. You know, I, some, at some point, I want to talk about this with the church, as we begin to settle down, as we begin to have some clarity about this. But when it comes to money here, I really want to do things very, very differently and very unconventionally, okay? Because I believe that being a well requires us to be generous, not looking conventionally at what is returns. Finally, the last thing is the woman at the well. This is probably the most famous encounter at a well. And this is the Lord's encounter with a Samaritan woman well documented that she encountered Jesus. 
through an encounter, not only was her life changed, her whole village encountered the Lord as well. You see, as we dig wells, one of the intentions that we desire is for people to encounter the Lord. For people to encounter the Lord. Right? Years, several years ago, when, while I was still in Cornerstone, we started the digital expression of church. And we did it because we wanted people to encounter God. We wanted people, especially who may not have been attending church, who may have been disillusioned by institutional religion, who are far away from God, we wanted them to encounter God in the safety and in the anonymity of their own bedrooms. Right? And God blessed it. And here, this is what we want to do. We want to look at things and we say, we want people to encounter God. The question I pose to you is this. Are you a well where people can encounter God? Amen? And it doesn't mean that you have to be superb in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that you have the prophecy working on you all the time. That's not what it is. I think people encounter God when they see the gentleness, the love, the kindness. You know, if we would stop for people, if we would pay attention just a little bit to the people around us. When you hop on the bus every morning when you go to work, if you just pay attention to who is the bus driver, because many times, you know, it's the same person and we will take the time and to care for them because God wants us to be a well and not just a fence. Amen.